just a, a, a notice. Uh, could you pray for us as a leadership? We're, we're tr trying to reflect on how we um, serve our, our children and primary age and high school age kids. And uh, um, we were hoping to have a meeting. In the uh, I'm kind of riffing a bit here, Bronco. You can help me if, tell me if I'm doing something wrong here. We were going to have a meeting next Sunday, but we've realized we've not given you enough notice because I wasn't here to announce it last Sunday. So I'm just wondering whether... Um, families uh, of kids who are in primary age and high school age, um, we could have a meeting after church uh, Sunday after next. Does that maybe work out, I, I reckon? Um, that would be good. Now, our um, thank you very much. Our uh, reader hasn't turned up, so I'm doing the reading this morning. So let's, uh, let's uh, see if I can remember how to read the Bible. <laughs> That's what you pay me for, isn't it? <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> okay. What I'd like us to do, actually, maybe, is uh, um, stand. This is what they do in some cultures for the Bible reading, out of respect for the Scriptures. And actually to read it together. How many verses have we got on this? Uh, 21 verses. Can we do that? Strap yourself in. Okay. And let's, uh, let's read Scripture aloud together. Um, because it is the word of God. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. <laughs> good reading. <laughs> we're having a glitch. And also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop, a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble heart, heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, 
even what they think they have will be taken from them. Now Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. And in some traditions they say, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Just thinking about um, the cans before we get into this word this morning, uh, um, Sue leaned over to me and said, do the calculation of how many people are here this morning and divide that into the 700 to get to 1,000 that we have to do by next week. I'm going, I can do theology, maths is hard, you know. (laughs) So if somebody can work that out, you know how many cans each we need to bring next week to get to 1,000 by next week? That would be, that'd be fantastic. And let me know halfway through the sermon and go, I've done the math, okay? Don't ask me to do maths here on a Sunday morning. <laughs> okay, I want to talk this morning about having a life that allows God to uh, uh, grow uh, in us. Um, and hopefully, uh, we were going to look at our Bibles this morning, but this is, this is a, a bit of an old-fashioned look at uh, Bible apps and how people who bring paper Bibles look at those who have smartphone Bible apps. Okay. Pastor uh, Perry Com- Coma, not Perry Como, Perry Coma, was preaching on this passage and he said this my, my sermon focused on how God knows which of us grows best in the sunlight and which of us uh, needs shade. For example, I said roses must be planted in the sun, but fuchsias thrive in the shade. After the service, a woman face-beaming approached me. Your sermon did me so much good, she said. I always wondered what was wrong with my fuchsias. (laughs) Hopefully, it's a little bit uh, uh, better than that this morning. I want to uh, talk about, not not coming up there, um, growing in God and how that requires good, balanced soil. Uh, Fourteen. Not 42, but 14. 42, yeah, okay. 14 is the number, the magic number. Bring 14 cans next week, we'll get to 1,000 by next week, okay? Yes, okay, (laughs) thank you, yes. Okay, soil. Soil probably requires a whole bunch of, of different things, but it requires a balance of the good stuff. Not too much nitrates, not too much phosphate, an even spread, and not too much of the bad stuff, you know, mercury, sulfur, diesel fuel generally don't help things uh, to grow. And I came across uh, this story last night um, in the ABC News about some trees in Perth, in Kings Park in Perth, that were getting poisoned. And I, I thought, oh, I'll show you this picture, the before and after picture of the trees just a few weeks apart. And I thought, I'll have a word with Ian this morning. Um, about this story, because if you know Ian, he knows a little bit about trees. Turns out he was the main researcher for this. So Ian, come on down. Where are you? <laughs> Where are you, Ian? Don't hide. Grab a microphone. Have we got a spare microphone in there? Tell us. <laughs> tell us the easy take for the non-scientists among us, what, what, you, what you discovered here. I, I could talk on this for over an hour, because I have done that. What, 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 back in the 1970s, um, a, a farmer, a beekeeper actually in, in South Australia, um, sh- say, saw his trees dying and uh, they were going yellow. The, actually what happens is the, the, you look at a, a green leaf, all the, in the leaf, all the area between the leaf, which is the veins of the leaf, go yellow and the, le- and the actual veins stay green. So it was called intervenal chlorosis. Or, um, uh, because it was at a, a, a town called Mandala, it was commonly called Mandela Yellows, and so that's where the name came from, but they've changed it over the US Australia because they don't have Mandela over there. <coughs> it's all right. Um, so we, we, uh, they, f- they formed a task force because they thought at first it might have been a, a, a virus or, a, or a another disease that has hit into Australia, and so they formed a task force nationally, which I was part of, and, uh, and that um, 
we did a whole lot of research on finding out whether there was a biotic cause, which is, in other words, fungi or viruses, or, or whether there was an abiotic cause. And uh, the long story short is that it turned out to be an abiotic cause. And what was happening is that the, in this case, it was the, um, the limestone that was being used on the roads was actually causing the soils to become alkaline. And uh, in that case, it was locking up the ions in the plant and the plant couldn't get iron. And iron is really important in plants to create chlorophyll, which, is the which causes the leaves to be green. And uh, so they weren't able to pick up this iron and, uh, and therefore the leaves were going yellow. We actually, part of this, um, was it because it was a national task force, we had to go to all the states where the disease was. And in this case, we went to um, West Australia. We went to Kings Park and looked at their ones. We also went to another little park in, in uh, a garden in one of the councils there where it was really bad in there. And while we were looking at this thing, scratching our heads, what, what, what could this be? One of the neighbours came across the road and was, was saying, are you here to look at these trees? And he said, yep. It didn't have any issues until they started watering with, um, with bore water. And they thought, oh. So we took the bore water to find that it was actually pure alkaline. It was about eight or nine. It was coming up out of the ground and they were watering this plant with alkaline, so alkaline water and that was causing the plants to go into this lime chlorosis issue and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and the trees started dying back all over the place. So uh, they just switched it off the water. And at Kings Park, at least, they, they, they've actually gone through a big program of treating their water because they still need the water to, for their gardens. Um, so they've actually been able to treat the waters now and they've uh, got the problem back, sol solved the problem. So in Victoria, we've got a, a thing, thing where we use little plugs, little iron plugs, which we actually can put into the trees and that uh, turns them from yellow back to green within three weeks. So it, uh, it's improved it dramatically. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can I give him a round of applause? Uh, I landed him in that <laughs> last minute. <coughs> I think what Julian's trying to say is that what's in soil is really important to how you express the something, health of the Something tree. like that, yeah, <laughs> without all the technical detail. Yes. And um, I, went to, I went to my uh, doctor a couple of days ago and he said, I've got a bit of an iron deficiency. And so I'm guessing I just need to make, make the water a little bit more acidic or something, and I'll, I'll turn green. So when you, knew, you see me turning green, that'll be me better, you know. <laughs> so the, clock. So I, the, point, the point of all this is there's a whole bunch of things that go into soil, and uh, some are just actively bad, like, you know, very, very alkaline uh, water doesn't help. But some things are, are, are nutrients, and you've got to get the right balance of nutrients or if you're a human being, the right balance of supplements and that, uh, in your diet, are all the right things, and all the right vitamins, etc. And so as Christians also, we need a balance between uh, the positives and also to deal with the negatives, the bad stuff. And the trouble is that for many Christians, they think their job is to focus on the negative. I've got to drive out this, this bad stuff in me, this thing that I'm doing wrong all the time. Everything's about dealing with uh, the bad stuff in me. Whereas God very often will probably want us putting in a healthy diet of good traits that will in turn drive out the negatives. And so we're, you know, I hate, me, hate to be a stuck record, but this is why we're, we're focusing on good habits in home groups um, uh, at, at the current time and will be for some time, I suspect. Um, to not merely to say, oh, we drive out the bad stuff, but to actually put in habits that just don't allow room for the darkness to, to flourish or for the the vulnerabilities to flourish. So some of us maybe are really good at prayer or study, but, but weak or on, on practical care, and we need to develop some, some of that as well. Or to change the metaphor, we've got lots of vitamin A and B in our system, but not enough vitamin C in our system, and so on and so forth. The nutritionists, chemists, and gardeners among you are having apoplexy at my knowledge base at this point. Um, so I want to talk about the good traits that we need to nurture. These are not them all, but they're just what strike me uh, as I read the passage in the past week or so. And I will also talk about them in, in contrast to the negatives. But the important thing is, is the good traits that we're called to nurture and to grow. And this isn't a comprehensive list, but here's, a, uh, here's what we're looking at I I I this, mo this morning. Firstly, Sacrificial giving and social inclusion are what struck me from the first few verses of, of this passage. Welcoming others different to us was part of discipleship for Jesus. And in this particular culture, um, you didn't typically have 
um, such a crossover in discipleship groups between men and women. And the men were, were so different as well, even within the discipleship group, we get hints of conflict between the disciples at times among the twelve. But the wider group included women, and that was unheard of for a Jewish rabbi of the time. And so when Mary sits at Jesus' feet, um, I forgot what chapter it is, um, chapter 7 is it? Um, it it's a phrase of, that literally means a, a learning from a, a rabbi, being a disciple. And sure, the emphasis is on the twelve because of its symbolism as the new Israel. But women are there in the discipleship group right from the word go. And straight after this passage, Jesus says, look, gender isn't the thing. It's whoever follows God are my fellow disciples, my brothers, my sisters, whoever obeys the, the word of the Lord. And here in this passage, women of independent means kept the ministry of Jesus and the disciples going. In in that society, as I say, you, you couldn't officially be a rabbi's disciple if you were a woman. But in Luke, we see again and again a constant emphasis on the significance of women, women who sit at his feet and, and serve and care and love and are part of the learning group. And in fact, in Luke's storytelling, there's often actually the way he sets it out, because Luke arranges the material. It's not it's not a video camera operating through the gospel where this sequence follows that sequence. Well, no, no. Um, Luke is an arranger, an editor of the material that he got. And he, he often places a, a story about a man alongside a story that Jesus tells about a woman or, or an incident in, in, um, involving both. And there's a careful uh, balance there in, in how Luke tells a story. The good shepherd, the woman who loses the coin or the birth narratives have, have both men and women involved. Um, straight after this passage, you have the story of the demonic uh, man, and then that's immediately followed by s sick women uh, being healed. And Jesus and Luke uh, strike a balance that is not seen in other rabbis of the time. Another significant fact for me about these verses is not only that it was the women supporting the ministry, but the sort of women one, uh, one who was in charge of the, the king's accounts. Um, she was an accountant. Another was a woman with a dark background who had various demons cast out of her. Women of quite different backgrounds brought together under Christ to serve the Lord. And the Lord is the one who inspires all kinds of people to serve him. And the women and disciples didn't choose one another. You can't choose your family, right? Look around, you can't choose your family. <laughs> and they had to cope with who the Lord had chosen. They couldn't choose to leave the discipleship group and still be a follower. We, however, live in an age where we want to choose those we worship with. We choose our church on the basis of age group, style, our needs, uh, home groups maybe, dare I mention them again. Uh, the challenge is always to sacrifice our wants for the sake of the body of Christ, being open to people different to us. Unity in diversity is so, so important. It's difficult to maintain, but vital for health and maturity. We don't all think the same way. We don't all quite believe the same things, but we're all trying to follow Jesus. I've been some places where churches take the sheep analogy too far, right? <laughs> they all look the same, white, fluffy, going with the crowd, okay? And exclude those who don't think or behave the same. Might be subconsciously, people who don't quite hold the party line. I've been part of a church like that years and years ago before I was in pastoral ministry. In social psychology, it would be called social conformity. Social conformity makes us feel safe. Everybody's a little bit like us. But it causes those with different views, different backgrounds and so on to keep their head down and feel excluded at times. Now all social groups do that to some extent, but it should not be in the body of Christ. And Paul grapples with this in many of his letters. People who have different views, for example, uh, Romans 13, when it talks about people who have different views about different types of festivals. Unity does not, is not the same as uniformity. This would be a terrible church if you were all like me. Right? Everyone say amen. <laughs> we would never stop talking about Lord of the Rings. It would be just so dull, right? 
<laughs> that wouldn't be a bad thing, would it? Sorry. Um, but it's Jesus, the person who unites us. I think we can have conformity around the creeds. You know, that's why the church went for those things. The incarnation, the life and death, and return of Jesus, and so on. But let's have some wider wiggle room than has sometimes been the case. These disciples all had different understandings. We know this because even after Jesus is, is resurrected, they're going, will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus kind of goes, no, nah, you're not quite getting it yet because you are uh, the new Israel. So inclusion by Jesus meant being a rabbi with women disciples, with people of shady rap- reputations, with those in power, with those without power, uh, all kinds of, with Roman collaborators, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And Jesus welcomed the support and input of all kinds of people. And the first trait for healthy soil is to sacrifice the ego, in a sense. Those whom we serve with. Second trait. I've got seven of these, so strap yourself in. Um, Careful listening. Hearing God's word requires time for it to sink in. It was good that we uh, read it aloud today. It takes time to sink in. It will very easily get snatched away because we hear so many words. We're surrounded by so many words. We're overwhelmed with words. It's very hard to to process and to uh, absorb so many things. Firstly, I would say entrusting the Bible's reliability. Unfortunately, many people assume the Bible is an unreliable document. The truth is that of all ancient of all ancient literature, the New Testament is the most well authenticated document by a country mile. There is an overwhelming amount of evidence supporting its reliability. Now you will see various inter- internet memes which say, well, there's all these thousands of variants in the text and so on and so forth. But there are more New Testament manuscripts copied with greater accuracy at earlier dates from any secular classic from antiquity, whether you're reading Tacitus, Herodotus, Plato, Aristotle, n- names you maybe have heard of but don't know anything about. You know, if you, if you, just about everything we know about the Romans, for example, we get from Tacitus. The earliest copy of uh, Tacitus's Tacitus's that's easy for you to say. The um, history of, of, of Rome is the 9th century AD. Almost a thousand years later. And yet we know just about everything we know about Julius Caesar from that document. But you can analyze, you can dissect, and you can look at it and work out pre- pre- with precision. Now some people charge that there are grievous errors in the Bible. Actually, scholars who've examined thousands of manuscript copies have discovered thousands of variants. But every one of these variants is, is slight. I don't know if you can uh, read, read this line here. Can you read what it says? You have just won a million dollars. Right? right? So, so that's exactly like the kind of variants we get. In the Bible, this, you can work it out. It's not rocket science. If you know your Greek, you know your, your, your yeah, okay, it is a bit rocket science at times. Uh, but my guess, you, uh, n- not many of us would have a problem working that out. Now, 99 point, I would say 99.5 percent, um, I've done the maths, because I'm not very good at maths, um, of textual variants are of that kind of category. Okay? So let me give you a, a uh, an example of, of this uh, from more recent times. October 2003, um, Odyssey Marine Exploration recovered a ship's bell off the coast of Georgia in the USA, believed to be from the ship called the Tennessee, which sank back in 1865. At the time when it sank, it was believed to have about $180 million in gold in it. Uh, they aren't absolutely certain that it's the Tennessee beca- because the, the bell's inscription is of, the, of the ship that they found is partially obscured. And only, only uh, the letters S-S-E-E are visible. Right? The rest of the inscription 
won't be legible until it's cleaned. I've not actually heard the end, of, end result of this story. But with $180 million at stake, do you think they will allow this tiny fragment to stop them looking? Right? How much more is it at stake for us to seek the kingdom of God with all our passion? Even if we just got those little niggles, those bits and questions that we always have, but to keep going. So, knowledge does not require absolute rock-solid certainty to cause an active response. I went to a lecture recently at our Melbourne School of Theology where there was a Jewish uh, professor who'd been doing some archaeology in the area of El Lakshish in Israel, and he had found a tiny lice comb. <laughs> Great stuff to be an archaeologist, eh? a, a comb for lice. And it was only a tiny little thing. And they were able to decipher the words on this comb, very, very small writing, um, from Canaanite. And it's the first complete sentence in Canaanite that they had found. And, and relating it to other languages and through a complex process of linguistics, they were able to work out what this comb said, which was something like, uh, may, may the gods get rid of all the lice on your head or something, something like that. You know, great to be an archaeologist, eh? Um, and this... But the good thing about this, at the site where they were digging, which was an area that was um, around the time of, of King David and King Solomon, ju and just before that, they found names on pots that are there in 1 Kings. Now, Neville, you might, uh, you might know this. I mean, we've kind of grown up in the years of ministry having uh, some lots of skeptical people saying, oh, well, the stories of King David were written, you know, 600 years after the event to invent uh, a, a, a story for Israel to have as a founding story. Nah, nah. They found that in precisely the right date time. These names that don't get used 100 years either side of this particular day. And they're able to go, one, king, one Kings is telling an accurate, giving an accurate record of that particular period in time. We can't get, you know, there's no video camera there, as I say, to, to operate, but we can trust the Bible. We have to interpret. We have to understand what it's trying to do. Sometimes it's trying to engage us in debate and discussion, and it's not neat, and you can't tie all the bits easily together, but the Word of God comes, and it is trustworthy. But knowledge does not require certainty. Uh, to generate a response. So careful listening. I'm really running out of time this morning. Um, listening carefully to God's word requires um, listening in the circumstances of life to God's word as it comes to us through one another. So God's words with a small w at this point. Sometimes it will come in the written or in the intuitive. Sometimes spoken in creation, God will speak to us. I remember going to a beach once and, and just seeing some small creatures on the sand and suddenly I found God speaking to me in that situation. If we are steeped in the written word of God, we should also be open to God's voice speaking in other ways. There may be no more books to be added to scripture, but God continues to speak in dynamic ways. The psalmist says, all creation declares the wonders of God. Those listening to Jesus at this time, would have just heard Jesus speaking. Now, we un now understand it as God's word. The crowd didn't know that, but they could probably sense it because he spoke with authority and not as the Pharisees would say. Now, don't get me wrong. The written scripture is vital. It's a plumb line. We mustn't get unmoored from this book. And there are all kinds of siren voices that can lead us away. It was very sad this week to hear of uh, the death of... Um, Tim Keller, thank you. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He was a, a tremendous preacher. Didn't always agree with him, you have to say. You always say that, but I didn't really have to say that. He's a great preacher, a very great e expositor of the word. Um, but but there, uh, you hear the voice of God coming through. If you're listening carefully in conversation, even in your workplace, even in, uh, in conversations with neighbors, sometimes... You get an instinct also to visit someone or give them a call, and we ignore it. This happened to me once, and I had a sense 
that I should visit an, an older couple. And I kind of delayed for a couple of hours, and then I went, oh, no, I really should visit this older couple in the church. If I'd arrived five minutes earlier, I'd have been able to help the wife who was struggling uh, to get her frail husband onto the sofa. Follow the instincts sometimes. We're taught to be rational about such instincts, and that's okay. But sometimes that, those ideas that float into your head may actually come from the one who lives in you, who speaks through your body. If you've offered your body as a living sacrifice to God, don't be surprised if he starts to speak through into your mind and into your feelings and into your emotions. It is not the core criteria. The core criteria is the word of God. Don't hear me saying otherwise. But it's far more dynamic than just a static word. And sometimes the very habit of dismissing such instincts serves Satan's purposes to allow it to be snatched away. We've all seen the quiz contestant who doesn't follow the first instinct, right? You've all watched a quiz show, and they know the answer. They come up with it almost right away, and they go, oh, I'm not too sure. Sometimes that first instinct is correct. God who holds all of creation, pervades every fiber of your being, and who is always talking may well want to get through to you through following an instinct or a dream in the night or whatever, sometimes through unlikely others. I'm not going to finish the sermon this morning. We'll, we'll, we'll continue this next week, I think. But many in the crowd would listen uh, to uh, Rabbi Jesus and just think, he's just one of many rabbis. Why should I give his words more authority? Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, said, he who can no longer listen to his brother will soon no longer be listening to God either. He who can no longer listen to his brother will soon no longer be listening to God either. Let me just one, make one more point. Endurance. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word, but they don't have root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Now, endurance is, is kind of related to perseverance, but it's not quite the same. Perseverance just simply has the idea of a long time, and that comes uh, later in parable form. But endurance here is the idea of when things don't work out. Jesus is saying, we've been rejected in the synagogues by various religious leaders. Don't give up because of discouragement. When your world goes belly up, keep on keeping on. When you're exhausted and you feel like giving up, when you're suffering, when you've sown and you've sown and you've sown and there's no fruit, keep going. I like to occasionally play golf and I do like the story of Tommy Bolt who had a terrible temper and once after missing six straight putts, all the putts just teetering on the edge of the cup, Bolt shook his fist at the heavens and shouted at God, why don't you come down here and fight like a man? Maybe you feel like that sometimes towards God. A plant without moisture in a dry and arid place at the first sign of trouble, it caves in, it dies. Keep seeking to push the roots down for moisture. The Valley of Achor in the, in the Old Testament it literally means the Valley of Dryness. And in the Valley of Dryness, you have to dig deep wells. So endurance is part of the deal. All of these things are going to have to combine together, and we'll talk about the last uh, uh, three or four uh, uh, next week. So endurance. I love this photo. When you've been attacked by wolves, but in spite of that, you continue shopping. <laughs> and on that elevated note, we shall, we shall pray. Lord, there's so many things that will take our attention away from you, so many things that will cause us to, to give up and to not endure, to not persevere, to not press on, so many things that will uh, cause us to not hear you and not respond to you, so many things that uh, cause the life of God not to grow in us, and yet you ask us for these few things, these simple things, these small things, these small habits that we've been talking about to enable growth, your growth in us. We long to be people who in two years' time can say we've grown, we've matured, 
we're a little bit more like Christ, just a little bit, or others say of us that thing. Lord, we long to, to see you um, mature us into the image of Christ. We long for you to transform us from the inside out. And so, Lord, we want to cooperate with your Holy Spirit and to do those things that you call us to do, that one thing, that one little thing perhaps, and to repeat that and repeat that until your Spirit comes in and under that thing and makes it something more than just a, a godly habit, but a habit that's infused with your Spirit. So, Lord, we ask, direct us to those things that we need to address, those nutrient lacks in our lives, those aspects of things that we need to feed into our lives that we might grow more into Christ's likeness. Teach us, Lord, we pray, and show us and direct us in the coming week in ways that surprise us and delight us because you are looking for fruit in our lives. And all God's people said,